Okay, in this chapter we're going to look at driving forces of weather. So we're going to be considering atmospheric moisture, the variables which impact weather, how clouds develop and form. We're going to look at air masses, fronts, and storms. We'll consider violent weather, and then weather forecasting. So there are four main factors that influence the weather that we experience on Earth. There is atmospheric moisture, that's the water content in the air. There's the temperature of the air. There's air pressure. And then there's the arrangement of land and water features, i.e. if you're near a big body of water or if you're near a big mountain range, these things can impact your local weather. And so these are the four things that really are the biggest factors for controlling the weather that we experience. So the first factor that we're going to look at is temperature. Now, temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of molecules. Kinetic energy is the term that scientists use to describe the energy of motion. And there's actually a formula for it. If you took Physical Science 1, you would have learned this formula. But even if you didn't uh, take Physical Science 1, the formula is easy enough to understand. I've written it down here. The kinetic energy of a mass is equal to one, time, one half times that mass times its speed squared. Uh, you multiply the speed by itself. That's how you square things, of course. And so the faster something is moving, the more kinetic energy it has. And kinetic energy is just the energy of motion. So if something's moving, it's got energy. And specifically, it's got what we call kinetic energy. And you can calculate the kinetic energy by using this formula. Now, if you imagine a big mass of air, say like the air in the room that you're sitting in, the air molecules are zipping about, bouncing off the walls, bouncing off of you. Some of them are moving faster, some of them are moving slower, but on average they have an average kinetic energy. Uh, so that average kinetic energy is what we characterize as temperature. Now, when you're talking about a solid and a liquid, things aren't zipping around the room like that, but they can be vibrating or moving in other ways, and so their motion uh, is also related to their temperature. But anyway, we're going to be talking about uh, in the air because we're dealing with the atmosphere and weather. So what we end up with is the idea at high temperatures, water molecules move fast because the higher temperature means higher kinetic energy, means higher speed. And so these water molecules, because they're moving fast, they have enough energy to bounce out of the liquid state into the vapor state. And so you get what we call evaporation. With increased temperature, there is increased evaporation. So if I have a pool of water here and I start heating it up, those water molecules are vibrating faster and faster. Eventually they're vibrating so fast they basically can just escape and become in the vapor state. And that is water vapor in the air. Now we talk about uh, humidity. We all have a sense of what humidity is, but it basically relates to the moisture content in the air. How much water vapor is the air holding? That's what the humidity is. Now the reverse of that is also true. When temperatures cool, that means things are moving more slowly. The speed is getting slower. Water vapor molecules in the air, they slow down. They lack the energy to remain in the vapor state, and so they begin to clump together. We call this process condensation. And so depending on the temperature, water vapor may con condense to form dew or clouds or fog. And if the cloud droplets get big enough, you get rain. And if it's cold enough, that can turn into frost or snow or even freezing rain or sleet. And all these factors are largely controlled by the temperature, which is also related to how much water the air can hold in the first place, as we'll see. Now, the next thing we want to talk about is humidity. Now, as we said, humidity is the amount of water in the air. And what we see is no matter how dry, quote-unquote, dry the air may feel, there's always some water vapor in it. And so we want to be able to characterize how much water vapor is in the air at a particular time. And we call that characterization the humidity. Humidity is the mass of water vapor uh, in a given mass of air. 
when the air is saturated with water vapor, we say it has reached maximum humidity. Uh, remember, we talked about saturation with solution. So if I dissolve, for example, we talked about how if you dissolve water in sugar, that you can keep dumping sugar in the water and more and more will dissolve, but eventually you get to a place where the water is effectively full. It can't dissolve any more sugar, and we say that solution is saturated. Well, the same thing happens in the air with water vapor content. As we add more and more water vapor to the air, eventually the air reaches a maximum value that it can hold. Now, what's interesting is that that maximum value depends also on the temperature. Warmer air can actually hold more water content, more water vapor, than colder air. So what happens if you have the maximum humidity, that is the air is saturated with water vapor, and you try to add more? Well, any additional water vapor will condense out to form water droplets. And those water droplets could form clouds, they could for form fog or dew or even rain. So these are the things that uh, happen when the, wa when the air is saturated with water vapor. Now we want to talk about something called water vapor capacity. Now, remember I said just a minute ago that the amount of water vapor that the air can hold depends on how high the temperature is. So let's imagine you have air that's not completely full, not completely saturated, but it's pretty close to being completely saturated, and then the temperature drops. As the temperature drops, the air can hold less and less water, and so if the temperature drops enough, the amount of water that the air has will end up being more than it can hold. And so what's going to happen? You've reached saturation, and the water is going to condense out of the air. The temperature at which this happens is called the dew point. Now, when the air is saturated that way, that is, it's reached its maximum humidity, we call that its water vapor capacity. That's the maximum amount of water vapor that it can hold. And this idea of saturation and water vapor capacity, they absolutely depend on the temperature because when the water when when the air is warmer, it can hold more water. Now, imagine that you have two water molecules and they're indicated in this little cartoon here. If the water molecules have a high kinetic energy, that is they're moving very very fast, when they hit one another, they're going to basically bounce off of one another. But if those water molecules are moving more slowly, they can condense. They can come together and join. They can form those hydrogen bonds that we talked about previously. So what that means, if the air is warm, the air containing the water vapor, if it's warm, that means that the molecules of water vapor are going to be moving more quickly and they're not going to be able to come together and condense. But if the air is cooler, the water vapor in the air can join together. So again, we see warm air can accommodate more water vapor than cold air. That's the big takeaway here. Higher temperature means more energetic water vapor molecules and that leads to evaporation. You have increased temperature, and increased water vapor capacity. That is, the air, when it's warmer, can hold more water. But if the air cools, the reverse is true. It can accommodate less and less water vapor. Cooler temperature means slower moving water vapor molecules, and that leads to condensation. So you get decreased temperature, that leads to decreased water vapor capacity. Now, when you listen to the weather report and they talk about the humidity, what they actually are talking about is what we call relative humidity. And what relative humidity is, is just what we see in this formula here. It's the water vapor content, that's how much water vapor is actually in the air at that point in time, divided by the total capacity of the water, the water vapor capacity. So the, the amount you have over the maximum you could have, and then times 100% to give it a percentage. And so if the water vapor capacity is a certain amount of water and you have half that water, that would give you 50%. Now, relative hum humidity, again, it depends on the actual water vapor content, that's how much water vapor is actually in the air, and it depends on the air temperature because that controls how much water could be in the air. 
Now, these processes of evaporation and condensation, they're going to be happening in the air at the same time. Now, the evaporation rate, how much uh, the water molecules are evaporating into the air, that depends on the temperature. But the condensation rate, that is how rapidly the water molecules are condensing out of the air, that depends on the humidity and the temperature. When the evaporation rate equals the condensation rate, the relative humidity is 100%. When the evaporation is bigger than or exceeds the condensation, the air is no longer saturated and the relative humidity is less than 100%. And if the condensation exceeds the evaporation, the air is supersaturated and water droplets form. This is the, the big takeaway. Now, we see this graph here, which looks maybe a little bit scary and confusing, but basically it's pretty simple. This kind of pink line here that you see, that is the line indicating where the relative humidity is 100%. And so... If you are at, say, 10 degrees Celsius temperature, we can come up here and see the maximum specific humidity in grams per kilogram. That would be grams of water, pa water vapor per kilogram of air. And so what we see in this graph is that as the temperature is increasing, the amount of water vapor uh, that the air, the maximum amount of water vapor that the air can hold is increasing along with this pink line. Now also in this graph you can see below this pink line the evaporation rate is bigger than the condensation rate. That means the air is no longer saturated and the relative humidity is less than 100%. That's obvious because this pink line is where it's 100%, so if you're underneath the pink line you're less than 100%. But if you're above the pink line the condensation rate is bigger than the evaporation rate and so water droplets are going to form out of the air. And you're going to get clouds, you might get rain, you might get fog or dew, but that's the process by which that occurs. Next we can talk about the dew point. The dew point is the temperature at which this saturation occurs. Condensation occurs when the dew point is reached. That means water vapor condenses high in the atmosphere to form clouds, or water vapor condenses close to the ground surface to form dew, frost, and or fog. So fog and clouds are basically the same thing, it's just where they occur. Now there's a little bit of a difference between them, but basically they're the same thing. And the dew point can be used to indicate the water vapor content. If you have a high dew point, that means you have a high water vapor content. A low dew point, obviously a low water vapor content. Now the dew point is always less than or equal to the air temperature. The difference between the air temperature and the dew point can be used to indicate whether the relative humidity is high or low. When the difference is high, the relative humidity is low. When the difference is small, the relative humidity is high. Now let's check our understanding. As air temperature increases, what happens to the relative humidity? Now keep in mind, we haven't said anything about the water vapor. So we've got the air is containing a certain amount of water vapor and the temperature increases. What happens to the relative humidity? Our options are the relative humidity increases, it decreases, or it's not affected by the temperature. Now, I think we can immediately eliminate this C because we know that relative humidity is absolutely affected by the temperature. I said that several times already. But is the relative humidity going to increase or decrease? It's a little tricky. The answer is it actually is going to decrease. Now the reason for that is that as the temperature increases the air is able to hold more water vapor. Remember relative humidity is it's how much you have divided by how much you could have. And so if the air temperature goes up how much you could have increases. We haven't changed how much water is actually in the air, but we've changed how much water the air can hold. So you're dividing by a bigger number, the relative humidity has to decrease, it has to go down. And of course, I haven't written it down, but this is all times 100%. I ran out of room. 
But anyway, you get the idea, hopefully, that this is why the relative humidity is decreasing. And that, that may be opposite what you would have guessed, but if you think it through, hopefully it makes sense. So let's look at another one of these check our understanding quizzes. When the dew point is high, what happens to the relative humidity? Does it increase, decrease, or be unaffected by the dew point? The answer is the relative humidity increases. Why? It's because the dew point is the temperature to which the air must be cooled to become saturated. A high dew point indicates a high water vapor content, which means an increase in relative humidity. Imagine someone were to punch you in the face, right in the nose, pop. What's going to happen to your head? It's going to be knocked back because that punch is applying a force to your face and that is the result of the punch. Now we live in an atmosphere composed of air molecules that are zooming about and very often they are smacking into your face and smacking into the rest of your body and they don't have enough force to knock you back like a punch but they are pushing against you when they smack into you and they're creating a pressure. The force of all these air molecules divided by the area of your face would be the air pressure on your face. Now we know also the air molecules move faster if the temperature is warmer, which means that as these air molecules smack into your face, they're going to be hitting you harder if they're moving faster, right? So the higher temperature is going to increase the pressure from the air on your face, on your body, and everything else in the room. So this is our takeaway. The Increased temperature increases the pressure exerted on you by the air. Now, another factor that affects air pressure is the density of the air. If the air is more dense, that means there's more air molecules in a particular volume. That means you're going to be smacked more. So if there's more air in the room to smack into you, you're going to get smacked more. That's going to create more pressure against you. So air pressure, density and temperature, these are all interrelated to one another. Now, the temperature and the air pressure, they can be changed simply by adding or subtracting heat from the air. So obviously, if I heat the air up, the temperature and the air pressure can change. If I take heat out, the temperature and the air pressure can change in the opposite direction. But it turns out there are situations where the temperature or the and or the air pressure can change without any heat being added to or subtracted from the system. And those processes are called adiabatic processes. So adiabatic processes occur when air is expanded or compressed without a heat exchange. One example of this kind of process can occur with air that cools as it rises. So what happens to warm air? We all know that as the air warms, it expands, it gets less dense, and so it rises. And as it expands, that process of changing the volume actually decreases the temperature. And so you could imagine a parcel of air near the ground that's at 15 degrees, and it turns out that for every kilometer that it rises, because of expansion, it loses about 10 degrees Celsius in temperature. And this rate at which dry air cools is called the adiabatic lapse rate. And by the way, by dry air, we just simply mean unsaturated air. Another example of this kind of process is something called a Chinook. A Chinook is these warm, dry winds that occur when cold air moving down a mountain slope gets compressed as it moves to lower elevations. We know that the air pressure down here is higher than the air pressure up here, and so when this air moves over this mountain range and moves down the mountain, the air pressure gets higher, so the air gets compressed as it goes to a lower elevation, and that causes its temperature to increase. And so it warms up even though there hasn't been any extra heat added to it. Now, adiabatic processes can also occur in moist air. Uh, as rising air cools to its dew point, water vapor condenses to form clouds. 
Because the process of condensation releases heat, the surrounding moist air cools at a lesser rate of 6 degrees for each kilometer rise. This rate of cooling for moist air is called the moist adi adiabatic lapse rate. And so with dry air, you get about 10 degrees Celsius cooling for each kilometer rise. With moist air, you get about a 6 degree uh, decrease in temperature with each kilometer rise. In normal conditions, air temperature decreases with altitude. That is, as you go higher, it gets cooler. This rate of cooling varies from place to place, and it can vary even over the course of a day in the same place. But uh, in general, this rate of cooling with altitude is called the environmental lapse rate, and the average environmental lapse rate decreases about 6.5 degrees Celsius for each kilometer rise in elevation. Now, normally, as the air warms up, it rises, and then as it rises, it expands and cools off, and so then it's going to sink back down. And so uh, this is what we call stable air. But if the rising air stays warmer than its surrounding air, it will continue to rise instead of returning to its starting position. This is called unstable air. Eventually, the air parcel will expand and cool sufficiently to match the surrounding air. When the temperatures match, the air parcel stops rising, but it doesn't seek back down to its starting position. So this is a characteristic of unstable air. It rises, but it doesn't sink back down to where it started. Unstable rising air tends to form clouds with vertical development. These are what we call cumulus-type clouds. Stable air resists this upward vertical motion, and it tends to form clouds that spread horizontally. These are what we call cirrus and stratus type clouds, and we'll talk about these types of clouds in more detail. The next thing I want to talk about is something called a temperature inversion, and this is the opposite of what normally happens. Normally, as you go up higher and higher and higher, the temperature gets cooler and cooler and cooler. But what can happen under certain situations is the air is actually warmer, higher than it is down below. And so uh, Los Angeles is a great place for showing how this can occur. Because Los Angeles is on the coast, and so you have the cold ocean here, and you have cool air coming in from the ocean. But on the other side, there's a mountain range, and... You have a desert on the other side of the mountain range. You've got hot air coming in, hot air coming down. And so you've got the cool air where the city is and the warm air coming above it. And so as you go up higher, at least for a while, the temperature's actually getting bigger. This is one of the reasons why Los Angeles has famously had a lot of problems dealing with smog. Smog being the pollutants in the air from things like people's cars, ex the exhaust from people's cars and factories and things like that. Normally, that stuff can rise up and get away. But because of this temperature inversion, the warmer air up above means that the cooler air here is trapped. Because, you know, we would expect warmer air down here normally and that warmer air would rise up. But that's not the situation you have. And so without that, the smog could be carried up by the rising warmer air. But since you don't have that, the smog gets trapped. And so that's one of the reasons why Los Angeles has had smog problems for a long time. Next, we want to talk about cloud development. There are four major cloud groups. There are the high clouds, which are above 6,000 meters. And those are cirrus, cirrostratus, and cirrocumulus. They're the middle clouds, which are between 2,000 and 6,000 meters. These are the altostratus and altocumulus. They're the low clouds below 2,000 meters. And then they're the clouds having vertical development. And so the clouds below 2,000 are the stratus, the stratocumulus, the nimbostratus. The clouds having vertical, vertical development include the cumulus and the cumulonimbus. That's all a big mouthful, and I don't expect you guys to memorize what all these different types are, but we are going to talk a little bit about some of their differences. So we want to talk about cloud development. Clouds develop when the condensation rate exceeds the evaporation rate 
above the lifting condensation level. A rising air parcel cools at the dry adiabatic lapse rate until it reaches saturation. After saturation, the moist adiabatic lapse rate controls how thick the cloud will become. The height of the cloud base and how thick the cloud becomes can depend on the environmental lapse rate, the dry adiabatic lapse rate, and the moist adiabatic lapse rate. And, of course, we're interested in precipitation, which is the formation of things like rain and snow. Um, each step towards precipitation is part of a collision coalescence process. You have the formation of dust, you have updrafts, you have the growth of stationary drops of water, and then you have the falling of raindrops. Now, vertical development in the cloud is necessary so that enough droplet collisions can occur. Now, one interesting thing is that raindrops tend to shrink as they fall. And this is because the evaporation rate exceeds the condensation rate once they leave the cloud. They're evaporating more than they're condensing, so they're losing water vapor to the air as they fall and they get smaller. If enough evaporation occurs, the raindrop can actually completely evaporate and disappear completely before it hits the ground. That uh, complete evaporation of raindrops is also called virga.